This is another in the series of Passive House videos. Many of the participants in our Passive House workshops ask questions about, in the general form, why is this Passive House process so complex? Passive House has an extreme performance goal, and to reach this, lots of stuff has to work well, and work well at all stages, from initial sketches, informed design decisions, and keen observations on site. Passive House is a challenge because the construction process has long been blighted by snagging. Seemingly endless sequence of minor faults on site. The design process also has its share of less than optimum decisions and habits that need shaking up. No snagging is a phrase that captures quite a bit of the essence of Passive House. A dispassionate observer would recognize Passive House as having many of the characteristics of a franchise. The term Passive House has value. Projects that fail to meet the expectations of the franchise don't get to be called a Passive House. So here's my take on how we get to know snagging. Over time, the Passive House Institute has found a mix of performance metrics that are a good predictor of buildings that perform to their standard. Their compliance tool, the Passive House Planning Package, takes in attributes of a building and decides whether it is likely to deliver. The next phase of the compliance filter is an auditing regime for submissions. Unlike the UK AECB, where self-certification is possible, in Passive House, third-party agents act as certifiers to review submissions. Here's a typical web page offering certification services. The extreme design goals of Passive House often require better than commercial kit. It's quite reasonable to ask, is product X suitable for Passive House? And the Institute has defined or adapted a number of setting standards to support these kinds of questions. Suppliers have an interest in certification, and the volume of products supports adaptations to testing labs that are required to certify projects. A disclosure here. It's quite possible to deliver buildings that work exceptionally well without attending a Passive House workshop. Indeed, practitioners have delivered buildings which might be certified without themselves ever having been certified as a Passive House designer or consultant. And of course, not everything covered in workshops will be new to every participant. But let's go over some of the workshop topics. First, there is usually an introduction to the big ideas. Any number of participants arrive with strange ideas about Passive House, its performance goals, and which aspects of building design and construction are of interest to the Passive House Institute. Here's a link to a short video talking about some of the big ideas. There will also be an overview of the Passive House planning package. This compliance tool is going to be the subject of quite a few sessions in a workshop. The PHI has chosen to implement it as a spreadsheet with a score of worksheets, and on each worksheet are hundreds of cells to fill in. You would expect to spend time on each of the worksheets looking at the types of data required. Certainly, it is a tool that folk working on projects will invest time in becoming much more efficient with, but the Passive House Institute is not so much interested in proficiency as that designers and consultants understand the methods being employed. This is serious hand calculator time. You're going to be manually working out U-values for walls. Oh, and maybe calculations which will identify the inside surface temperature, maybe the energy balance at windows, or per perhaps figuring out the impact of switching between two different kinds of MVHR units. There are likely to be a Passive House Planning Package case study. This will likely involve filling in what feel like a thousand cells in the compliance tool. And workshops will tend to link these interactions with the underlying theory. Expertise and speed in the planning package are unlikely to be achieved during a workshop. Ideally, the case study used will be somewhat constrained in its complexity. 
Once you put in a half dozen windows or so, there's little to be learned with yet another score of windows. There will also be sessions looking at construction methods that deliver the kind of performance needed in a passive house. So how do you identify likely candidates? What tweak to existing details might get you there? Passive house is also about encouraging new habits on site. Observational skills are a critical filter. If the habits on site can be shifted, then the performance goals are much more likely to be met. There will be sessions focused on thermal bridges. Thermal bridges are classic sources of snagging in the design process. So, how do you identify them? Well, there's going to be an awful lot of in a workshop that will help you gain skills in this. And at the end of the workshop, you probably will start noticing these beasties lurking just about in every drawing that you've done in the past. Eventually, folk figure out that the U-values in Passive House aren't particularly extreme. What is extreme is the reduction in faults, such as thermal bridges and le air leakage within the facade. Here's a sketch of a building section with lots of thermal bridges. But, of course, not all building sections are as clueless as this one. Some details that you've got might only require subtle tweaks. There will be workshop sessions focused on air tightness. We want windows, not facade faults, to be the preferred path for fresh air. You should expect workshops to help you understand the points of weakness in a facade, as well as a range of techniques which can help you limit unintended infiltration. You're also expected to understand the nature of the pressure test carried out as part of the certification process. Certainly a workshop goal is to better understand the constraints on those who are carrying out tests for things like air tightness and thermal bridges. Understanding their jargon is another step to reducing snagging. One of the big ideas in Passive House is that windows should no longer be a source of cold drafts and they shouldn't impact adversely on the comfort of occupants, no matter how horrible it is outside. So how do we recognize a window which is fit for purpose? What part do they play in compliance? Workshops are going to spend time on this. There will be sessions focused on interactions with the sun. It turns out that lots of designers have beliefs about how the sun interacts with the building facades that are way off the mark. That may be why a lot of conventional buildings overheat in the summer and don't take advantage of solar heating in the winter. You know, why should people draw the blinds because of glare? The Passive House Institute is not particularly concerned with glare, although you should be. But they know that a Passive House project are at risk of overheating if the design team doesn't get shading sorted. So workshops will likely include a session or two to improve your understanding of solar interactions as well as how the attributes of the building and shading make their way into the compliance tool. There will be sessions focused on mechanical ventilation. One of the core deliverables of Passive House is exceptional air quality within buildings, but we must deliver it with a minimum energy hit in terms of fan power. It needs to work well enough that the impact of fresh air on the energy balance is moderated during extreme weather conditions. Mechanical ventilation will be a new topic to some practitioners, and for others, it's just part of their day job. However, the extreme design goals of Passive House require a team effort. All the players in the game will be learning new habits. Why? Well, it's down to the word acoustics. The mechanical system must also deliver fresh air almost silently. The silent bit is so utterly different from the hissing that confronts us in commercial buildings. Workshops probably won't get to the minutia of the mechanical and acoustic engineering, but rather it will focus on the clear directives about acoustic performance. Participants are expected to understand that a quiet system requires a substantial reduction in the velocity within ducts as well as the provision of sound attenuators and careful selection of components. This requires space and very clear directives to those who are working out the details and those who are doing the installation. 
workshops typically use case studies and exercises to identify the special requirements of the mechanical kit that's going into the building so as to avoid that great sucking sound from the services engineer. There will be sessions on generating and distributing heat. Why? Well, the demand patterns in a passive house are sufficiently different from conventional buildings that we really do need to revisit our assumptions about how we generate and distribute heating and cooling within buildings. The result of all the other stuff that goes into a passive house means that when the environmental controls switch off, conditions just stay the same for a very long time. There is no night set because temperatures might drop less than a degree overnight. The peak demands experienced in conventional buildings were largely absent. You could probably heat a passive house with a couple of hair dryers. However, that's not what your client's expecting. So, what kind of devices might actually be reasonable in generating the magnitude of warmth and cooling needed in a passive house project? What's a good way to distribute this highly constrained heating and cooling? How might we control it? A workshop will typically spend quite a bit of time working through these topics. And there will be sessions about the economic decisions within passive house projects. Making decisions based on the trade-offs between capital cost and performance over time is a key skill. And workshops are going to spend some time on economic calculations. Yes, present value calculations, annuities, rational choices between glazing products, or many, many other what-if questions that arise during the life of a project are fair game. But not by way of an application on your smartphone or within a spreadsheet. Nope. We're going to be keying in equations in a hand calculator. For some folks, this is a no-brainer. For others, well, it's been a decade or more since they touched such topics. There will be sessions exploring the design process for Passive House. Of course, the Passive House planning package case study might get you slightly past the novice level. The real test becomes trying to apply the new design and construction habits you've been learning within a building. The planning package, of course, is a compliance tool but many designers and consultants will use it to test out their ideas for proving performance. Such what-if studies are often a feature in passive house workshops. And there will be mock exams. Passive house exams are, to put it lightly, a singular experience. There's a lot of work to do in a limited amount of time. It's an open book exam, except that the book is about worth a thousand slides of workshop materials, you know, another 300 pages of the planning package manual, and the odd dozen documents from the Passive House website. Getting a taster of the scope and intensity of the exam is an aspect of many workshops. Of course, the specific wording and images of exams are closely guarded. Mock exams could follow the general style and types of questions, cover a range of likely topics. Participants will learn a lot about themselves, their strengths and weaknesses during mock exams. The real passive house design includes a design task. So demonstrating knowledge about equations and some knowledge about the compliance tool, not quite the same as demonstrating that you actually can pull it all together. So the exam includes a design project as a vehicle for demonstrating the application of Passive House ideas. You're going to do this by annotating and adding directives to a set of plans, sections, elevation, and details. So classic homework tasks for participants is to take recent projects and re-express them as a Passive House. Annotate them with Passive House specific directives. Get used to that process. Of course, if you do it a few times, one of the consequences is you're going to get some really important clues about how your working practices and workflows are going to need to evolve. I happen to use materials originally developed as part of a European project. The Passive House Institute also have authored training materials that some workshop presenters will use. 
and organizations such as the AECB in the UK have authored their own training materials. Their manual for the compliance tool is also a useful re reference. At the end of the day, are workshops worth it? Traditionally, workshops require about 10 days of participants' times. That's a significant investment. Since COVID, many workshops are held as a mix of online pre-workshop tasks and Zoom sessions. Indeed, the workshops I am involved in are a mix of online materials and Zoom sessions. Hundreds of practitioners across a range of professions have found workshops an expedient choice. Many architects and engineers believe there is a value to being a certified passive house designer or consultant, and they view workshops as a vehicle to achieve that certification. But they're also unusual suspects. Managers of professional firms as well as construction firms or local authorities often join workshops to better understand how to empower their staff. For many, it answers critical questions as to whether their organization should take part in this market. Manufacturers also attend. They're looking for better ways of offering services, what kind of products might be useful. They also want to understand the nature of their future customers. Designers and installers of mechanical systems. They've also come on workshops to explore what is required to deliver into this market, how they might move up the value chain, what skill sets they're going to need to invest in in order to deliver the efficient and quiet systems required in Passive House. And what about the exam? Well, I once commented to a Passive House staffer that the exam was actually quite difficult for many of the workshop participants. They were really surprised that anyone would find it difficult. And that is what we're going to go over in the next video.